Hello, everyone. This is Gary Price, and it's time once again for an open access interview. Today, we're going to head to Athens, Greece, to speak with Natalia Manola from Open Air. Natalia, before we begin, could you introduce yourself to our audience? Um, I am the managing director of Open Air. Open Air is an initiative uh, for open access in, in Europe. Uh, my background, I'm a physicist, a uh, bachelor in physics, uh, and then I had a master's in uh, uh, electrical and computing engineering. I have been running uh, Open Air since 2009, since uh, it started, it's the beginning. And I'm also... Um, coordinating a European project called Open Minded, which is uh, opening on text and data mining on scientific publications, which is very much related to, to Open Air. Could you tell us a little bit about the history of the Open Air project, when it began, and really why it began? Where was the need? And I, and I believe there was a predecessor to Open Air. Could you speak about that as well? Yes. Okay, so if, if we are to start from the beginning, uh, we know of the 2003 Open Access uh, Declarations and the subsequent, uh, subsequent ones. And we were lucky in Europe to have some visionary people uh, within the Commission that they saw the need for Open Access, they saw the, the future. Uh, they connected the dots very early on, so um, there was a commissioned, uh, again, a uh, project called Driver, two phases, Driver and Driver uh, 2, uh, 2005 to 2009, which was um, a, a technical implementation of bringing network uh, repositories uh, together, so a network of repositories, institutional repositories. So at that time, we focused on, on the open, on the green open access. Uh, then the commissions, the Europe's, uh, the European Commission's uh, open access pilot came in 2008, and we got a project uh, called Open Air. The first one was Open Air, the first phase, uh, to implement this um, this uh, pilot uh, with the institutional repositories with green open access in mind and to report back to the Commission the lessons learned and how we can move uh, forward. From then on, uh, because it was a successful uh, project, the Commission um, uh, extended the, the open access policy. Many member uh, states uh, in Europe, uh, plus countries around the world like the US or uh, countries in, like Latin America, they had uh, the open access policies and we were able to grow, stay in Europe, still stay in Europe because our focus is in Europe, but to cover all of the European area. And this is where we are now. Uh, we, uh, Europe has uh, uh, a total coverage of open access in um, uh, publications. And we are, uh, as we speak, we're running a pilot on open access and research data. And Open Air is one of the projects, not the only one, but one of the projects uh, that we are uh, uh, um, implementing this. Let's go back a moment. You said one of the uh, early on, uh, the uh, European Commission said the project was successful. Yeah. What made what made them determine that it was successful? What were you doing at that point to make to have them make that determination and keep the project moving forward? Okay, there, there are two aspects on this. You know, the first one is that they first they saw that um, the technical there was a technical com comp competency uh, competence. Uh, there was a technical competence from from the partners that the institutional networks were indeed network and connected together. Uh, second and most important, I would say, is that uh, the project uh, established a, a human network around Europe. So at that point, we had uh, 27 uh, what we call national open access desks. Now we have 33. These national open access desks are representative in each member state, in each country in Europe. Uh, which are, they, they act like ambassadors of open air 
and of open access in um, in general uh, they are the ones that uh, approach the scientists the researchers they are approach the, the they, they provide the local support to the libraries uh, they are the ones that they talk that, that talk to and uh, talk to policy makers about policies so the, the 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 open air through its network really um, uh, covered all of Europe uh, very fast, and then one of the other um, uh, because of that and because of the technical competence uh, and putting a lot of um, extra effort from the consortium, the European Commission now as a funder but not as a policy maker but as a funder, uh, were able to, for the first time, as they say in their history, uh, to uh, grasp the output of their programs. Because through open air and through open access, we were able, in order to get the measures out, we were able to say uh, from the pilot which project is, uh, is producing which publications, which are open access, which are not open access, because we needed to have all these metrics. And for the first time, they had a project, an infrastructural project, that was able to give results to the Commission itself. So really, when you were, when you were speaking there, you were speaking both about the technical infrastructure, but you were also talking about the role of the different national organizations, the Open Access Desk, I believe you call them. So really, Open Access is, is kind of, uh, excuse me, Open Air is a kind of a multi-pronged project. In other yes. words, you have your technical staff and people developing uh, the technology for the uh, institutional repositories to talk to each other, but mm -hmm. also the idea that you have to sell the idea to the researchers. Yes. I mean, it's not only selling the idea, it's selling the idea of open access. Second is uh, selling the idea of how to go, you know, the, the selling the implementation. So Open Air is uh, one uh, implementer. Uh, through the gold open access as it emerged, we have uh, another implementation of open access. Through the gratis open access journals, we have another, another, um, uh, another implementation of open access. So what we are doing in open air is we, we have this human network, first of all, that they talk to each other, they learn from each other. Uh, the more advanced, the more advanced um, members are giving, uh, you know, through our network, they're giving for free their advice or uh, the examples to, to, the, to the poorer networks, to the poorer members. And because Europe is, you know, the one, one, one of the characteristics in Europe is our, our diversity. We speak different languages, we have uh, different national infrastructures. So how are we able to bring this together? Unless we had these people and these organizations, uh, people and organizations, uh, representatives of open air, this would have been hard. But because we had that, I think this is our strongest point, and we are building on this, and uh, we can see that other regions around the world, so they are looking into the open-air model, and which is the technical plus the human, and see how they could um, uh, advance it, uh, adopt it, uh, and adapt to their um, situation. Let's go back to the human side of things. You talked about how members from different nations, you know, they speak to each other. Could you give us an idea of what they're talking about, some of the topics they're talking about, uh, and that type of thing? I mean, I, I can tell you how open air works, and there is a list of a list of, uh, of issues that that we have. So, because we are thirty three members now in open air. Uh, uh, it's it's really hard to manage this kind of network. So what we are doing is because we know that Europe has uh, different regions and the geographical regions uh, also play a role in the cultural behavior. So we have uh, the the very uh, obvious north, uh, south, east, and west regions in open air. So each of these uh, regions with the nodes. Uh, virtually meets every month 
they are talking on a, a, on different issues from technical implementation to approaching policy makers on how to approach researchers so they are comparing and they are finding the gaps and this is how they are brought together monthly monthly uh, virtual conferences then we have um, um, open air meetings uh, which they uh, I think they happen once or twice every year and uh, this is uh, by itself is an exchange of information could you talk a little bit about approaching researchers you know what what are some of the things that you might have learned from your colleagues about how they're approaching researchers to get them interested in contributing is there anything are there any kind of generalizations you can make about some of the ways that um, your staff and your colleagues around uh, around Europe reach out to these people what do they tell them you know, I think, uh, first of all, we approach them through the libraries. Libraries is a very central uh, role in, in open air. Uh, most of our national open access desks are very central uh, research libraries in organizations in, uh, in, in Europe. And I think the idea that we've learned so many years in, in our ex from our experience shows that the researchers, they can be approached, uh, they are willing to listen, uh, but it's a different question if they want to um, to implement, uh, to, to go ahead and follow the instructions. So what we have learned is that, you know, the, the, the usual um, uh, stick and carrot. Uh, the stick is the open access mandates from the, policy, from, from the funders. So most of the researchers will get grants that have, uh, that comes, uh, that is accompanied by a policy. But the carrots are the services, and unless we are able, and this is this is where Open Air aims at building, is that we are building an infrastructure that we hope that the services that are built on top of the infrastructures uh, in this infrastructure will infiltrate the, the the daily workflows of the researchers. So when somebody is publishing, for example. Uh, let's say they publish in an open access journal or a closed journal, uh, would this be able to be reported directly to open air somehow through the publisher if we have some brokering services and then we report to the commission or to the other funders that we affiliate with, affiliated with um, and be done with it. This is all they're asking, is that they, they are doing research, they want to publish, whether this is a, um, uh, where this is a publications or data, and they want to report. So we are aiming at that, to bring in these small services that, uh, they, um, that they like. And I think the next step is to show how this interconnected world um, really shows, uh, brings out their impact because uh, what they care about is, of course, is they get the grant and they want to be able to, um, to, get to, to, to be okay with the funders for the open access policies. But the next thing, thing for the researcher, for most of the researchers, is the, 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 the peer collaboration plus the career assessment. So we are working, we, we, we are having small services around these areas, and this is what they like, and this is how uh, we approach them. I would be remiss if I didn't ask you, um, what type of feedback have you heard from publishers, major academic publishers, about the Open, Ac uh, open Air Project? And what, what are some of their concerns, uh, both currently and in the past? And the ones in the past, how have you worked with them to make them not concerns now? Okay, there the, the are there were many concerns. I think in the beginning they did not they did not um, pay lots of attention to a European initiative. I think when things are starting to get global, and this is where we're working with the coalition of open access repositories to say uh, is to make sure that Open Air is a regional uh, repository or open access uh, infrastructure in Europe, but we want to make sure that we, we connect with similar initiatives around the world. So once we, do, we did that, or we, it's in our aim to do that, 
most of the big publishers uh, began to pay attention to us. And I think uh, they are open to collaborations uh, as long because they understand that uh, the model is changing. It's just that they are trying to find their way around and uh, uh, as we all know there is room for everyone as long as Everyone is making money out of services and not as proprietoring the content. That's, that, that's the key uh, thing that we should focus on. They are beginning to understand, you know, do, are we patient enough to give them time to move on? They are not moving on very fast. So, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a give and take situation. But we are in good relationship with most of the publishers. Uh, and especially open access publishers, uh, we work with some small ones uh, because one of the things that we see as, as, as a value added of repositories is the easy access of the content because a few open access publishers uh, or many of them, uh, it's not technically easy to get to the content in a bulk mode uh, especially for text and data mining. So we're working with them in order to see how how we can have how can they be part of the whole infrastructure. Natalia, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us in this uh, open access interview, and we would welcome you back again very soon.